Hey out there everybody in virtual land, uh, Osborne here. They are all over there, so I'm gonna go ahead and take that off for a minute. You can see this beautiful visage uh, right here. Uh, today we are talking a little bit about Europe. Europe, what is Europe? Um, so we're gonna talk about that a little bit today um, with our the time that we have. We have a lovely studio audience here of uh, four folks, which is pretty good numbers for me uh, in, my, uh, in my little uh, game show, I guess, of sorts here. Uh, I'm rocking the Virginia sweatshirt today, which I was wearing other sweatshirts, uh, different videos. Uh, but we are talking about Europe. I have it kind of divided up just a little bit here between Western and Eastern Europe. You may see that I got a little bit tired on the bottom part here, <laughs> just because there's so much stuff that you could literally put in for all this. So uh, we'll go into a little more detail about this as we are talking uh, through it. But uh, we do have a little bit more specific kind of stuff um, up here at the top. Um, it is kind of funny because we were talking today in class about sort of what is Europe a little bit, right? When we're talking about various... Um, locations and like continents and stuff like that. So don't forget Europe is that peninsula off of the Eurasian landmass. So it's like Spain and Germany and all that kind of stuff. Russia would be included here. Uh, you could also potentially, like there's a couple small things like the Ottomans do control part of Europe. So depending on the time period, like maybe uh, this time period, you might be able to talk a bit about the Ottomans there if you wanted to, but they probably wouldn't be your best option. But you could certainly do so potentially because they do occupy most of um, the Balkan Peninsula. Okay, so that is what Europe sort of is. But generally speaking, we will see a little bit of a kind of cognitive division between Western Europe, which is going to be everything from like Germany and Austria to the West, and Eastern Europe, which would be like Poland and Hungary and the Soviet Union or Russia. Uh, depending on your time period. So a little bit of a difference between those. The primary difference between those is sort of when they start here in the 1200s or so. So in the 1200s to 1450s, as we'll get into in just a second, we are going to see a lot of like change here, like a move away from medievalism here. So like less serfs and all that kind of stuff. But the thing about it is that Russia will not make that same move until a little bit later. So like some of these kind of earlier things, like the social categories of serfs and all that, are not going to really change for Russia until a little bit later. And that's going to be one of the major distinctions that we'll see. But what that means then is that Russia is going to come late to a lot of stuff. They're going to come late to things like the Enlightenment. They'll come late to things like industrialism and imperialism and stuff. So they're going to be a little bit late in all those kind of things. All right. Look at our time periods here again. 1200, 1450, 1450, 1750, 1750, 1900. So we got four, again, divisions here that are related to uh, our test. Um, and let's take a look at all these things. So first off, starting off, we got feudalism and manorialism. Anybody out there help me out with those two things? What's feudalism? No, they can't help me out. That's all right. Well, maybe we should know a little bit more about it. Uh, feudalism, again, is going to be that structure where you have like a king and a lord, or a lord who is then going to have uh, people below them. So minor lords and knights all the way down to peasants. It's a structure that is political as well as social in the medieval era. So it's going to dictate like what your social class is, but also sort of like what level of control you have over the political body as well. And manorialism then is sort of the economic version of feudalism, where it's kind of like tied in with feudalism. So feudalism would definitely encourage things like serfs working on manors, uh, but the serfs working on manners is a part of that, that whole system. Manorialism is really that kind of idea that you have individual manners that are going to be mostly self-sufficient from each other. So you're not going to have as much trade except for things that are like very minor, you know, stuff like that. So that's the beginning point that we're at is about 1200 or so is we are going to start off with this very medieval, feudalistic, manorialistic kind of structure. Serfs then are going to be a big part of that structure. Uh, the serfs are going to be the labor that is tied to the land. Remember, slave, serfs are not slaves, right? They are not owned by individuals. They, in a sense, are owned by the land. Like, they just can't leave, though. So, for example, if you're a serf and you do something bad, the, uh, the, you know, the knight or the lord that controls your area could definitely like whip you or arrest you or something like that. Well, the one thing they can't do is kick you out of the land. They can't say, like, you are not allowed to live here anymore. You have a right in feudal society to live in that space that you were uh, previously in. Um, now, again, that, that could be, uh, uh, so that, that could be a good and bad thing, potentially. Okay, um, as economics go here, it's mostly gonna be agricultural. So we're gonna have the three field system, which is designed to help improve crop yields. So more food and stuff coming in to help increase populations. And so over time, we will see an increase in that population, uh, which is going to eventually lead into things like our, our time period two here. But we are gonna see a couple of things that are gonna be uh, knocking back those populations a little bit. One of which would be say the Crusades, 
okay? And the other would be the Black Death, which are kind of one after the other. So let's talk about the Crusades first. Crusades are a great example of sort of cross-cultural interchange, both in the sense of sort of violence, I guess you'd say, but also uh, the, uh, you know, all these folks going to a new place and like kind of bringing in new ideas and new, uh, new cultures and things like that as well. Uh, but at its most basic then, again, this is Pope Urban II is going to call for a crusade uh, into the Middle East. Uh, the Middle East, uh, Jerusalem in particular, had, was under the control of Muslims, and they felt like they needed to change that. One of the biggest reasons for that was that the Seljuk Turks, who were in charge of this area at the time, uh, decided that, I can't remember if it was either they put taxes on um, Christian missionaries or whether they just refused to let Christian missionaries come in. But one of those two things happens, and they immediately realize this is a bad idea, and they switch their idea. So like they're like, oh my gosh, wait, this is a terrible choice. But in the meantime, though, the Europeans had decided that this was something that they were going to have to deal with, that like, oh my gosh, we can't go visit the holy sites anymore. Uh, we have got to, uh, to change that. And so Pope Urban II calls for a crusade, uh, and there are four kind of historical crusades that you know, should know about, the first, second, third, and fourth. First and second and third are kind of okay as far as their accomplishments. The first one does take part of that territory and establish things like the Kingdom of Jerusalem. They kind of like get less successful from there. And then in the fourth crusade, a whole bunch of people just go and like sack Constantinople for no reason and then just leave. Like they don't even make it to the Holy Land. It's pretty much a disaster. Uh, there are other stories of other crusades that may kind of exist, but it depends on what you mean by a crusade exactly. Uh, but those are the major ones that happen there. So what are the consequences of those? Well, we're going to see a lot of these sort of second and third sons are going to go, and they're going to end up getting killed, uh, which is not good. You're going to see some new political states being formed there. You're going to see new connections. So new things like a lot of um, a lot of these uh, these soldiers and others who go there start having a liking for different types of foods and spices. They know that trade is coming to that area, and so they want to increase that trade as well. So it has a little bit of an influence on that place. You could argue, for example, that some of that new information that's coming in uh, ties into the Renaissance, which we'll talk about in a second, that some of these like famous books from Greeks that have been preserved by the Arabs uh, are going to come through and, uh, and start to influence European culture again. Um, also, though, in sort of the same time period-ish, we are going to see the Black Death. Uh, that is the huge plague that comes through Europe and kills enormous amounts of people. Some places it was up to 90% of the local population. Uh, but it kind of went across that entire continent for quite a while, depopulates lots of areas, uh, really kind of sets them back just a little bit in that period in front of the Black Death. Mm, mm, mm. Uh, during this period, we will see a lot of um, we'll see a lot of trading going on. I mean, Europe is essentially at one end of these trading routes, right? So whether it's the Silk Road, Trans-Saharan, or Indian Ocean Trade Network, uh, the Europeans are really like there, right? So like the Silk Road is going to go across uh, Asia, it ends basically in kind of Constantinople, and then things get shipped out from there because Chinese want to trade with Europe, Europe wants to trade with Chinese, and these other groups are in the middle. Trans-Saharan trade, very similar as well. It's coming up from West Africa to the uh, Mediterranean coast, and then it's making its way across the Mediterranean into Europe as well. And then lastly, the Indian Ocean Trade Network. Uh, again, it seems far away, but especially in the Roman times, a lot of those goods that were coming from India were going to the coast and then being shipped up through Egypt, through the Nile, to then be transported across the Mediterranean. So again, same kind of situation here where they're going to be trading back and forth. So Europe is heavily involved in these trading networks. Um, at the end of this period then, we are going to see the creation or the whatever, like the, the emergence of this thing known as the Renaissance. Renaissance means literally rebirth, like people are being reborn. Well, what are they being reborn from, right? Uh, it is from the knowledge of the Greeks and the Romans. So there is this sort of myth in European culture. Like they imagine that you're in like Italy and all around you, you see these gigantic aqueducts and all this like stuff that is from the Roman Empire. Well, you may see all that stuff and decide, well, we are not good. We are not powerful like they were. We are living in a lost age, right? And so that is sort of the, the perspective of it, is that the Europeans had lost all of this amazing culture of the Greeks and the Romans. And so as they start to bring it back, there is a rebirth, in a sense, of this culture. The idea that all of a sudden they are you know, bringing all this stuff back up again, and they're going to be as amazing and awesome as the Romans and the Greeks. Now, obviously, we realize that's not quite true, really. Um, you know, a lot of those things have stuck around for a long time, and some of the others are not as wonderful. But uh, that's just sort of an idea for that. Um, if we go over a little bit over here to Eastern Europe, uh, we are going to see Kievan Rus, which is sort of the beginning group uh, of Russians, basically. Uh, now, they are actually going to predate 1200, but that's sort of the 
the important sort of context here. They will be destroyed by the Mongols, um, and they will that will cause the cultural shift from Kiev, which is the capital today of Ukraine, up to Moscow instead. So we'll end up having these guys, these princes of Moscow, will be an important part of it as well. But this is a period when Eastern Europe is not well connected uh, to uh, Western Europe. They don't have a lot of connections. They definitely do trade and stuff like that, but mostly it's very similar. We're going to have this sort of manorial system with serfs and stuff like that, uh, but uh, it is not going to be a very powerful area. Questions on 1200 to 1450. There's obviously a ton more details here about these different like structures and stuff like that and like what's going on there, but good. Okay. So um, at the end of the period then, as we see the Renaissance come in, we start seeing all these new ideas, right? Like new ideas of politics and technologies and cultures and all this kind of stuff. Um, and that is going to have a huge impact on the rest of uh, Europe. So in this time period, 1450 to 1750 then, we are going to see a huge change. Like if you just think about a couple of the things that are going on here, this is when Columbus will sail across the ocean and, you know, um, interact with the Americas. Uh, this is the time period where we're going to see like the movement towards absolutism. We're going to see things like the Reformation. Like it is hugely important to, uh, to this era. This is kind of really where Europe sort of comes out of its shell in a sense, right? So one of the big things we're going to see here uh, in this period, and again, this is all sort of in the time period. It's not as... Um, it's not as like chronological within this little box. So just understand like, you know, this, this ex exploration is occurring before some of this other stuff. But basically during this period, politically, we are going to see monarchies are going to gain in power. So under feudalism, the king was pretty weak, really. They had to rely upon older lords and, and others to kind of keep them propped up on the throne. So in this time period, then, whether they're going to do so through constitutionalism or through absolutism, we're going to see monarchies gaining in power. Like the monarchies, the centralized governments of these states are going to gain power. And because they are able to gain this extra power and organization, that will allow them to do things like exploration, like they're able to fund a bunch of money. As one example, right, we have the Spanish uh, kingdom, the newly formed Spanish kingdom um, of, um, with, I um, can't remember the names, Ferdinand and Isabella, right? So when they come together then, they will then kind of push themselves towards more absolutism and they will centralize their power within themselves. So that means that when Columbus comes knocking, they're able to give him money. They're not weak. They don't have like no money or anything like that. They can fully fund his expeditions because of that power that they have. And the same thing will also occur in places like England and other places as well. We're going to see a lot of power that's associated with those, those areas. Two of the best examples of this sort of monarchy is gaining power, but equally weird because they're in different areas. One is going to be England and the other will be in France. So in England, we have a group called the Tudors who are going to gradually move towards more constitutionalism. All right. So one of the biggest factors here we're going to have in 1215, that's actually in the earlier period, but we will have uh, the Magna Carta, that which, while it's kind of like rejected and not really put out there, at least brings out the idea that the king should also live by laws, that the king cannot just do whatever they want, that they should be able to live by laws. Um, additionally, then, during this period, we'll see the influence and power of parliament. Up until the 1600s in England, when in the 1600s, the parliament literally takes control of the country under Oliver Cromwell. So... While the king is getting a bit weaker, the centralized power of the government is getting stronger. So like under the parliament, we will see things like a brand new military force being formed, uh, new types of like conquest and things that they're doing. Like all of that stuff is like super important um, and super centralized. But while they're doing all that stuff, though, they are firmly within this constitutional mode. Um, on the other hand, then, we will see Louis XIV, known as the Sun King, do the opposite through an absolutist form of government. Instead of sort of centralizing the bureaucracy and allowing things like parliament to get power, he will control all power. It will all be centralized into him uh, in this sort of absolute monarchy. This is the idea of the divine right of kings, that God has put the king on the, um, on the throne, and that is where that king should stay. Um, this is the guy who uh, also, like, you know, Cardinal Richelieu helps him take over control. He is going to build Versailles as a part of that. He is also going to do this system whereby everybody has to like live at Versailles on occasion so that he can control them um, and keep them from doing anything. It's called the theater state where he basically runs the whole country um, as a part of that. Questions to there? So mostly our constitutional governments are going to be like Britain and the Netherlands. Our more absolutist governments would be like Spain and France. All right. Um, another couple of little revolutions and things that are going on, we have the Reformation and also the Counter-Reformation. 
So this is the period then when we are going to have Luther nailing his 95 theses to the door of the Wittenberg Cathedral. In the process of doing so then, he will launch this revolution, basically, this huge reformation. Um, and again, he's not the only one controlling it, um, so he will be one of the early groups to do it. But we will also have other groups such as uh, John Calvin as well as uh, Henry VIII in England. So if we look at those individually, we have Luther, who is a monk, and he is primarily concerned with issues related to corruption within the Catholic Church. He feels that the Catholic Church is corrupt, that it's causing all these problems. He initially wants kind of reform, but eventually believes that he should break off and change uh, the church on its own. Um, another person then, Jean Calvin, is going to be a uh, French uh, Huguenot who moves to Switzerland. And in the process of uh, his reformation, he is going to come to believe in a very harsh God, like uh, Calvinists believe in that predestination concept which is that uh, everybody's fate is sort of already predetermined, and also that uh, God is not sort of this like kind of super loving God, but instead is a very, uh, very, you know, not brutal. Like it's not, he's not like mean or anything like that, but it's just like he's very stern and strict. Like he has certain rules and we need to kind of hold on to that. And then lastly, we have the Anglicans, which is going to be in England. This is Henry VIII, who is upset about the power that the church has over the, th the authority of uh, monarchs. So that is going to be expressed, of course, in the famous problem he has where he wants to get a divorce, but the church will not let him. And so he is unhappy with that. And so he will end up splitting off and forming his own church known as the Anglican Church instead. So three different major figures here in the Reformation, three different kind of reasons for them. You know, So everything from corruption to state power, uh, but they're all going to do things to try to break away uh, from the um, uh, from other things. Okay? Now, the Catholics are not going to take this laying down. They want also to get some counter-reformation going on here. So this basically is where they decide, well, we should change these things. We should do something instead. We should make a few uh, changes. So they get together at a council called the Council of Trent. The most important thing about the Council of Trent, though, is that while it does do some reform, so it'll do things like banning some of the worst offenses, like, um, uh, what do you call it? indulgences and stuff like this, they do reaffirm the basics of the Catholic Church. Like these guys like Luther and others are like, no, we should all be able to make decisions on our own. So the Catholic Church will reinforce the idea that the church has an important place within Christianity. Uh, but they will also say, yes, some of these things were wrong. We need to move back towards those and change a few of those things. Um, one of the examples of that is allowing the Jesuits, uh, the specific group to be involved uh, in, uh, in missionary work. Uh, another would be things like uh, this council. Uh, others could be things like just sort of trying to get people to come back into the fold instead. Along the same time period then that this is all going on, we will also have the scientific revolution. So uh, Sir Francis Bacon and his ideas of empiricism, the idea that you can do something and repeat that experiment over and over again to get scientific truth uh, is something that's going to come up in this period. We'll also see like Galileo, we're going to see all these astronomers, Kepler and others are all going to be examples of scientific revolution figures that will arise uh, in this time period. Any questions to hear before we get into exploration? Y'all are very quiet today. Nobody's got any questions? Doing all right. Do y'all remember a lot of this stuff? I feel like sometimes like the European stuff is stuff that people remember a little better just because it's more closely associated with America in some ways, I guess. But no? Kind of comes back, yeah. All right, well, let's take a look then here um, at exploration. Okay, I put it in parentheses, exploration, scare quotes, because uh, again, these places had already been discovered, <laughs> but we're rediscovering them again. Um, so when it comes to these different powers of the Europeans that are going to be exploring, we are going to start off again with our good friend Portugal. Okay, so Portugal will be the first of these European states to start exploring. Um, again, there's a couple different reasons for that, one of which is that they're on the Atlantic coast, so they kind of have this incentive to go that direction. A number, another is that they had a couple of important figures like Henry the Navigator and a few of others uh, who were like Vasco da Gama, who were important figures in doing this sort of exploration. Uh, but they'll be the first ones. Uh, they're going to make their way down the coast of Africa, and then they'll make their way over to, um, over to India, and he will start uh, doing trade there eventually. Now, the thing is that Portugal will then take over control of the Indian Ocean Trade Network in a big way, but they won't hold on to it for long because other people are coming. Next up is going to be Spain. So Spain will actually go the other direction, of course, with Christopher Columbus. They will uh, take over control of the Americas, and that will be a big part of their um, exploration. They will also have the first person to go around, or first group to go around the world, Magellan's expedition. 
Um, France and England will come a little bit later because they had uh, some kind of political problems that were going on. But eventually they will also start doing explorations uh, around the world. And England in particular will end up kind of pushing Portugal to the side. They're, they're unable to maintain control uh, because Portugal is just too tiny. They're just too small to be able to kind of resist larger countries like France and England. Some of the, a couple of things that are going to help this happen is going to be new technology. So things like the astrolabe, uh, the compass, the caravel, which is that ship that can go into these places. These are all new technologies that are going to help make this stuff go pretty well. One of the things that's going to happen during this period then is that we are going to have, of course, our Colombian Exchange and the Triangle Trade Network. And that, of course, will lead to the great shame of slavery, specifically chattel slavery that we're going to see being moved across these oceans. Now, again, chattel slavery does not come to Europe necessarily. Like Europe is not, uh, I mean, they do have slaves, obviously, but it's not as big of a deal because they don't need them as much. They're going to mostly be in places like uh, the Americas. Who's got questions here? Uh, no, we're going here, 1750. So French Revolution is like 1786, I think. Yeah, so American Revolution is 1776 until 1783. So it'll be a little bit later. We're not quite there yet. But I mean, the things like this stuff, like the um, the monarchies gaining power, absolute power, this is what's going to lead to it, right? So Louis XIV is going to gain more and more power, and so his grandson, the 16th son, the 16th, is the guy who's going to tick off everybody so bad that we're going to lead to the, Ameri to the French Revolution. Because you'll notice we don't really have that in England necessarily. Like England doesn't have those things because they have more constitutional government. All right, let's go over real quick to Eastern Europe then. Let's take a look over here at our Ivans, okay, and others. Um, so we are going to have a couple of different figures over here that are important. So um, the Kievan Rus are destroyed by the Mongols, and they're going to be under like the Mongols and their successor states. So there's a whole bunch of these sort of like nomadic groups that are essentially like you know forcing taxation and tribute out of these Russian princes. So in Moscow, for example, you have a Russian prince who is basically being extorted uh, by, the, um, by the Mongols, and so he is getting tired of it. He doesn't want to do it anymore. And so the first guy we're going to have is Ivan the Great, or Ivan the Third. He will break free from Mongol authority. He's the guy that basically leads to the independence of Russia. He is the prince of Moscow, so that's how we shift the cultural thing from Kiev to Moscow. Then, uh, a little bit later on, we're going to have Ivan IV, who is known as the Terrible, le Terrible. Remember, that term does not necessarily mean like he's terrible, though he was, like he's not awful. It means like the powerful, the awe-inspiring. Um, he very famously, this is a Rurik dynasty. He very famously will kill his son and successor, which means that when he dies, he will not have a, there will not be a clear line of succession over who's going to take over next. This leads to a period called the time of troubles in Russian history where everybody's fighting each other and like Poland's trying to intervene and all this awful stuff. Eventually, we will have Michael Romanov and the new Romanov family that will take over. Yeah. Why did Ivan kill him? Yeah, because he's crazy, basically. Like, uh, so he was apparently sleeping with his stepdaughter, or with his uh, daughter-in-law, I should say. Uh, and uh, his daughter, and so his son found out about it, confronted him, was angry, and so he beat his son and killed him on accident. Like, hit him in the head with a cane and, like, killed him and stuff. So, yeah, he's a bad person. He's, I mean, like, you know, <laughs> that's just, that, that's the way it works. Um, he also famously has this, like, uh, secret police called the Oprichniki, um, who are designed to keep the boyars in control. <laughs> oh, is that like what? That's what they're called. Um, all right. Uh, next up then. So a little bit later on, after Ivan the Terrible, we have Michael Romanov. Well, after Ivan the Terrible, we have Michael Romanov, the new Romanov family. That will be the family that controls Russia from then on out. So one of the first great ones that we know here is Peter the Great. Uh, this is the guy who is the big Western you know, fan. Like This is the guy who's like six foot nine. Uh, red, flaming red hair and all this. Uh, and uh, he really liked Western stuff. So he wanted to have a big like navy and stuff. He is going to be the one who creates St. Petersburg, uh, this new capital that's on the coast uh, so that they can like have a coastal capital instead of cold, cold Moscow instead. Um, a little bit later on then, we will have Catherine the Great who will sort of follow his same ideas. She will be the one who is also a big fan of the Enlightenment. She kind of overlaps these two. Okay, so she kind of goes down through here. She's a little bit of an overlap here. But she will also be one of the ones who's kind of bringing in ideas of enlightenment as well. But during her reign then, she'll have a number of peasant kind of rebellions. So for example, this Pugachev rebellion, which is designed to overthrow her, but is not successful. These are just like super quick, easy hits on some of these people. Okay, any questions on that?
All right, we're rocking that along. No questions. Um, I'm in the yeah, so Pukachev said that he was her husband who had died. Like, she basically kind of killed her husband or, like, got rid of him. Um, and so he supposedly claimed that he was that guy, Paul, but, I mean, nobody believed him. But that was his claim, basically. And so he was trying to rise up against her in, in return for that. Again, she was German. She wasn't Russian. So there's some, like, debate. Like, according to her constitution, she was in charge, but a lot of people weren't happy about her. So, Okay. Well, uh, let's move on to our next time period then, 1750s to the 1900s. we got a couple of different changes here, a couple of big ones. Let's start off with the Enlightenment. Let's become enlightened, ladies and gentlemen. Um, so remember, the scientific revolution is all about empiricism, but it's going to be that empiricism is applied to scientific things. So, gosh, I wonder why these stars twinkle so beautifully at night. How about I take out my, my astronomy <laughs> telescope? I was going to call it an astronomy viewer or whatever. But yeah, let's take out my telescope. Let's take a look at the stars, right? And so if I see that the stars rise the same every day, maybe that means that they're there or whatever, right? So they're going to take that idea of scientific investigation and all that, and they're going to put that as far as the scientific revolution. But what happens then is a number of people decide, well, look, if the world is run by like rules, right? Like if the stars go through the nights for certain reasons, if we can predict all these things, can we not do the same thing with human beings? So this is the beginning of sort of our soft sciences, our social sciences, where we will study people and we will talk about it. So we are going to start to have things like a whole bunch of people writing books about government, for example. So Hobbes, Locke, all these folks are going to start writing books and say, hey, if we do these things, this will be appropriate or this will make things better. You know, governments work better in this circumstances or that circumstances. And then we'll have all kinds of other examples like this. So like lots of societal stuff. So they debate things like capital punishment. They debate things like governments. They just, they debate all this different stuff as a part of the enlightenment in an attempt to kind of make things uh, a little bit better. We did a, like a little project on different people. Who was your person? Do you remember that? Um, Olympia de Gauche. I don't remember. I don't know. It's fine. I don't remember. Anybody remember? Do you remember what yours was? Mine was the woman. The woman. <laughs> there was more than one woman. Um, it was the writer and her daughter. Mary Wollstonecraft? There you go. Yeah. So she is, again, writing The Vindication of the Rights of Women, uh, where she argues for uh, women's rights, basically. Yeah. All right. Um, so that is our Enlightenment figures. Okay. Uh, next up, then, based upon this Enlightenment, right, we're going to have a lot of these Atlantic revolutions. Now, I included things like Haiti because it's sort of tangential related or American, but really, if we're talking about specifically about Europe, you're mostly talking about the French Revolution here. Okay. But all these others are going to be inspired as well. So uh, in America, then, the Americans are inspired by people uh, who are writing for uh, writing in the, Revol in the Enlightenment to say, hey, maybe we need to have our own representation here. Maybe we need to do things on our own. And so they will rise up in 1776 and get independence. France will assist them in doing this. And then that, again, because of the debt associated with that, as well as just unhappiness in general, leads to the French Revolution. And the French Revolution is going to be a peasant, sort of civil war-based kind of revolution. Uh, they will briefly get rid of the king. They will end up having Napoleon, of course, who will end up taking over half of Europe. And then he will get kicked out. And they'll go back to a king again. So, you know, success. Um, that also will inspire some other revolutions, specifically Haiti in 1806, um, because Haiti is unhappy with the circumstances related to the French Revolution. Um, and then also these Latin American revolutions as well. But again, these are kind of outside of our scope today. But those things are inspired by uh, these revolutions, these Atlantic revolutions. Questions about any of those? Remember, we're not doing a ton of detail on these, so if you have any questions, just let me know. All right, we got a bunch of new ideas in this time period as well. So uh, in addition to the Enlightenment kind of stuff, capitalism, socialism, we got empiricism, like all these isms that are out there that are like changing people's lives and perspectives and stuff. Uh, next up, we have the Industrial Revolution. So the Industrial Revolution uh, is uh, a huge, huge factor here. Uh, people start creating, uh, going from like sort of like work in their homes to going to work in factories and stuff. Um, so they're going to create all that. But they're also, don't forget, going to create more... Uh, devices for more food. Uh, they're going to create more medicines and things. We have this paradox where people are dying because they're living in closer contact, but they're also living even better because of all the extra food and stuff that is available to them. Um, as a result of the Industrial Revolution, then, they become so productive that the Europeans need to go someplace else. They need to find other places to sell their goods to. 
as well as to uh, get their materials from. And so that is going to be where we move into imperialism. So these uh, parties will start moving out through places like Russia and, uh, sorry, not Russia, moving out through places like uh, Africa as well as India and Southeast Asia to, to colonize and take control of uh, these different little areas in order to get more materials for the raw, raw goods that they need for the Industrial Revolution as well as new places to sell those goods to as well. they got to sell it as well as gain it over time. I feel like we've talked about this like a million times recently. <laughs> like I don't really know what else we need to go into on that. Uh, when it comes to Eastern Europe, we don't have a ton going on here. Uh, primarily, we're going to see a couple of conflicts where Russia ends up being pretty bad off. So the Crimean War, for example, is going to show kind of how backward they are. But during this period uh, here, we're going to see like Catherine the Great and others are trying to bring enlightenment into Russia. Uh, they aren't really happy with that. Um, they lose the Crimean War. One of the uh, czars will attempt to free the serfs. Well, he will free the serfs. Uh, but people get unhappy about that because they want more advancement. Like they don't think he goes far enough, so he gets assassinated. So like we basically have this sort of like issue of reform that's going on there. Like they realize that they're kind of weak, but they don't necessarily know much about what to do with it. Now we'll come to a head in 1905 when we have these revolutions. So moving then from 1750 to 1900, again, this 1900 to present is really a lot in Europe about sort of the failures of imperialism and like how it collapses on itself. So like World War I and World War II are essentially like the end of the imperial age. Uh, I did not put a ton up here because, again, we could talk all day about these things. Like I don't know how much you want to talk about World War I or World War II. I would love for you just to ask questions if you want to. Um, but these two conflicts are going to be the ones that uh, are going to be defining for 1900 to present in Europe as well as the Great Depression. Okay, So just a couple quick things. World War I, remember, is basically about imperialism. Like they're all unhappy with each other because they all have different uh, territories and stuff. They all are sort of competing with each other. Um, and so they're doing so through like militarism and stuff. That's a key factor for them doing that. Um, we have Archduke Franz Ferdinand is the guy who's assassinated. That sparks off all this other stuff like alliance structures and militarism, which leads to a war. That war is disastrous for many reasons, kills lots and lots of people for no good reason whatsoever, um, and uh, basically destroys a whole generation. After that war is over, then we will have an economic collapse that's called the Great Depression that is brought about by American uh, stock market. Um, that will hit uh, that will hit Europe especially hard because they are trying to recover from the problems of World War I. So that will lead to the rise of these sort of hard right movements like fascists and Nazis and others. That then leads to World War II under Hitler and others. That war will end in 1945. Yep. Um, can you tell um, like why different countries joined different powers during uh, World War I? World War I. Yeah, sure. So part of the, she's asking about why people join different powers in that period, why there are different ones. So part of it is going to do with, uh, like, if you think about uh, the, the, so there's a little bit of ethnicity there that's going on, right? We talked about self-determination. So the Germans and the Austrians are both German-speaking peoples. Um, the uh, Serbians and the Russians are both, like, Slavic peoples, right? So that's a little bit of it. Um, there's also uh, things that are related to, like, uh, just protection. So, like, France if they are worried about Germany, their obvious ally would be the Russians on the other side of that group there, right? Uh, the French and the British have an alliance, uh, a loose alliance, but they have an alliance because they are both democracies, right? So there's like all these little kind of connections that are associating with these different groups. If you're asking why didn't like Germany and France ally, I mean, that's part of it is just this sort of natural enmity that they have with each other. They just don't like each other very much. Does that kind of answer your question? Okay. Other questions? Well, when we shift over then, World War II ends 1945 again. We move into this stage called the Cold War. So the Cold War is uh, caused by a couple different things. But again, the biggest factor is the United States wants to allow for voting in Eastern Europe. They want to, under the Soviet authorities, they want to have some sort of free elections going on in, in Eastern Europe. But the uh, Russians do not want that to take place. Um, the Russians, on the other hand, are looking for security. They are afraid of being attacked and destroyed again. So they really want to maintain uh, the, the security that they have. And as a result of that disagreement, we start some, sort of this process of a Cold War. And there's lots of little things that are going to occur as well. So like the United States will not include the Russians in their um, economic aid. They're going to freeze the Russians out of the nuclear program. Like all these kind of things are going to be stuff that are going to upset uh, the Russians when all this takes place. Uh, eventually what we will see then is that all the Western powers in Europe, so like France and West Germany and Britain and all that, will form NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. On the other hand, then, the Soviet Union will organize its satellite nations into the Warsaw Pact to oppose them. 
And this whole Cold War will be what's going on from then until like the late 90s. There's never like any open warfare in Europe. Again, we do have some in Korea and Vietnam, but in Europe, there's no open warfare that takes place. Uh, there's lots of like spying and stuff. There's going to be lots of like, you know, Germany, you know, East Germany, West Germany kind of problems. We've got the Berlin Wall, all that kind of stuff is going to take place. But there's never sort of any like open firepower or attacks or anything like that. Questions there? Yeah. So what was Germany's role in keeping intellectuals in, in Europe and Korea? What was the point of Right, okay, so first off, you have to designate there's not one Germany, right, there's two. There's West Germany and East Germany, right? So the problem then is that when they split Germany up, the theory was that they were going to just like split it up according to the powers, and then they were just going to re put Germany back together right afterwards. So these divisions were meant to be temporary. So like East Germany, which is controlled by the Soviets, and then there were the other part of Germany was controlled by the United States, uh, Britain, and France, right? So the idea was they were going to keep them this way for a few years, put them back together. They'd have a new country called Germany. Everybody would be happy, right? But the problem is that as everything breaks down due to the Cold War, um, the Russians are not willing to give up their part, and we're not willing to give up ours either. So we end up forming two different countries, which is uh, West Germany and East Germany, right? The thing, though, is that they also divided up the capital. That was part of their little thing, was they were going to divide the capital amongst all the allies as well. But when they do that, then, again, same problem. They don't want to like, give up their portion to it. So weirdly enough, we end up with a situation where half of, the, uh, half of Berlin is, is controlled by the United States and its allies, even though it's in the middle of, of East Germany. It's super weird, right? So the problem then for the East German government is that the East Germans kept escaping into West Berlin. They kept like running across the street or like trying to get into those other areas so that they could gain freedom. So they would jump out of, out of buildings, they would do all the stuff to try to get over into the West so that they could be successful. So the way that they decided to stop that was they built a security barrier, right? Um, and that security barrier initially is not too complex or whatever, but over time it becomes more complex. But they essentially put this wall up almost overnight, like a temporary wall overnight, and then over time they build it up more and more and more. So the idea, again, is to prevent people from crossing through that border to go uh, into the, the West. Did that answer your question? Okay. Cool. Now, if we go back over here to Eastern Europe, then we got to rewind just a little bit, okay? Um, so Revolution of 1905. It's going to be the first one here. This is going to be as a result of the Russo-Japanese War. The Russians are going to fight the Japanese. This is the first part where they, they lose, and so this is the first part where they realize, oh my gosh, we're in a really bad situation. So the revolution in 1905 it leads into having like a parliament that has a reform that they were trying to do for the Russian government. They're also going to end up uh, you know, changing a few other things around, but it's kind of too little too late. So once World War I starts up then, the Russians get involved. They don't do very well. And so by 1917 then, the whole thing is kind of falling apart. Uh, the uh, Russian people are unhappy and upset about everything, and so that will lead to a re revolution in 1917, which ends up being won by the communists. So we have the foundation of the Soviet Union from 1917 until 1991. During World War II, the Soviet Union is, is profoundly beaten back pretty hard, but they are able to fight back uh, battles like the Battle of Stalingrad, so that the Soviet Union ends up being one of the victors in that war. Um, and then after that, then, of course, we will enter into this Cold War uh, with, the, with the West. Um, and ultimately in 1991 then, that whole thing will fall apart. Uh, and we will have now Russia, as well as all of its constituent little states and stuff that fell apart from the Soviet Union as well. Okay. Um, after that then, like Unit 9 talks a lot about like globalization and all this kind of stuff. Again, globalization here is going to be like Europeans are mostly exporting globalization. Like they are, they're, you know, like think of Eurovision, how people watch around the world, or like Great British Baking Show, like a lot of the cultural things that are coming from Europe are going to go around the world, much like they are for, uh, for the United States. Uh, but obviously, they're also doing the same thing we are, which is exporting uh, goods and like jobs and stuff to other places as well. So same situation where like people in Europe don't really make a lot of things anymore. They'll make like really high end stuff like computers, and like really nice cars or something or like things that don't make any economic sense. Uh, to ship, but mostly, again, they're having a very similar circumstance that we do when it comes to globalization. Okay, yeah? Um, so if only 1903 wasn't like, and then like maybe the whole Cold War, Russia was like, or not, the, the Soviet Union was like this big superpower, mm -hmm. how did they get there? How did they become a superpower? Like, yeah, throughout. after World War II. Yeah, so a couple different things are going to happen there. 
they were not. I would not probably consider them a, a, a superpower before World War II. Like they were definitely powerful and they had a lot of influence and stuff. Um, but they were not one of the biggest powers in the world. What happens then is that that after the war, all the other powers are basically devastated, right? Like Japan is destroyed, Germany is destroyed. I mean, all these other countries are just hobbled and weakened. So really, at the end of it, the two countries that came out of it, while Russia was heavily damaged by the war, the two that came out of it with the most powerful militaries and stuff were the Russians and the United States, right? The Soviet Union and the United States, right? So one factor of it is that. The other is that when it comes to nuclear weapons, the United States and the Soviet Union are going to be the only ones that have nuclear weapons until the 1950s, right? So that alone puts them in the, in the status of a superpower. Um, also because of they consider themselves an ideological challenger to the Americas that also sort of like positions them also as that. The United States was like a clear power, you know, in the world. And so the way to make the, the, the Russians kind of position themselves in a sense as the opposition to that power of the Americans. So that would be the other way that they do it as well. But yeah, I mean, it's mostly things like that. Like they definitely have a strong economic program of centralized control and stuff, which is also going to benefit them. So within like 10 or 15 years, they'll have a pretty powerful military. Um, one of the things that's crazy is that like at one point in the Cold War, probably like the 1970s, early 1970s, like if we had fought a war against the Soviet Union, we probably would have lost, right? Like right after the war, we probably would have won. Uh, and, you know, up and through the 80s and stuff, we probably would have won. But, like, through the 1970s, they were really beating us pretty bad. And it's only because of the profound, like, kind of development and stuff uh, in the, the late 70s, early 80s that we really end up having a bit of a change of that. And part of it also has to do with Gorbachev opening up the country a bit. Like, he opens up the country and everybody wants, like, consumer goods. And they can't handle that. And so they try their best to do it, but they just can't afford it. They just cannot keep up with the uh, United States when it comes to being so productive. Cool. Other questions? These questions can be about Europe and what we talked about here, or they can be about anything else. Any, any questions at all? What you got? Anything, anything, anything. Okay. Well, we will go ahead and end there from here. If they have a couple additional questions, we'll see how that goes. I love you guys. You're the best.